Thank you so much for being here with us today, both in the room and online. We're just uh, very glad that you joined us here uh, to hear the Word of God, to worship together, to get better. Thank you for being here today. Well, today I'm going to start a brand new series, and we're going to talk about this over the next several weeks, and I hope you will be at every one. If you are out of town on a particular Sunday, make sure to watch it online. Because I believe this series that we're going to be in in the next several weeks will be particularly helpful to you in your spiritual journey. I'm going to start a new series today called The Habits That Make You. Now, your character, your spiritual maturity, and your success in life, they depend on the habits that you have in your life. Spiritual habits, in particular, are important for you to have strength of character. They're important for you to be able to have a closer relationship with God. And how you succeed in life is not forged in the public eye. It's not forged in the the glare of everyone watching you, the glare of the lights. But your character... Your success, whether it's in business or personal or health or whatever, it is forged in the private moments of your life. It's forged when no one is looking. Uh, You hear athletes talk about this all the time, that championships are not won in the moment. They're won in practice. They're won in how people... Uh, commit themselves to work when no one else is watching, when no one else is cheering. It's kind of like what Tobin was talking about earlier about Financial Peace University. You can have success financially. And no, it doesn't require you to win the lottery. Uh, You can have success financially, but it's what you do in those private moments. It's the habits that you establish when no one is watching, that over the long haul will determine how successful you are. Today, we're going to talk about, in the beginning of this, how to establish good habits. How do you establish spiritual habits that will sustain you during difficult times of life? How do you establish spiritual habits that are going to help you go through times of discouragement, help you go through times when maybe no one's watching. How do you establish these kind of habits? And at the very end of the message today, I'm going to talk about one habit in particular that you can start this week that I think will be a great help to you. We're going to read from 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 1 through 12. This was the Apostle Paul who was writing to a young pastor. He was actually the pastor of The church at Ephesus, a very large church, a very influential church, and Paul was writing to this young pastor, and here's what he said to him, and I find this very interesting in what Paul told Timothy to do. He said, now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, some will turn away from the true faith. Everybody say true faith. What is the true faith? What's the real deal? How many of you know, and don't raise your hand, but how many of you know that we live in a culture that a lot of false goods are being sold? A lot of false spirituality is being sold. I am always amused by people that say, well, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. It's always funny to me. Well, Paul said that in the last days, some are gonna turn away from the true faith, the real deal. And it says they're going to follow, they're going to follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. There are people that are deceived. If you're not careful and you don't exercise spiritually and establish good spiritual habits, you too are vulnerable to deception. And that's what he's saying. He said, these people are hypocrites and liars and their consciences are dead. Have you ever noticed that your conscience can become 
I like how it says in the old King James Version that their consciences became seared. You ever notice that when you do something, the first time it was like you're worried, you're afraid somebody was going to find out, you felt bad, your conscience bothered you, but after the 10th or 12th or 20th time of doing it, it doesn't even bother you anymore. You don't even think about it anymore. Well, that's what he's talking about here. He says, they will say, and he's talking about people that are deceived and these false teachers. They're going to say things that aren't true. Notice what he says. They will say that it's wrong to be married. Well, obviously, it's not wrong to be married. God's the one that ordained marriage. They said, it's wrong to eat certain foods, but God created those foods to be eaten with thanks by faithful people who know the truth. The next time you go to Chick-fil-A, you can quote this verse, all right? So and some of you say, well, what about bacon? I love it, all right? So uh, it's like the old, the old country song, I like it, I love it, I want some more of it. That's what I think every time I eat bacon. But he said, since God, uh, since everything God created is good, we should not reject any of it, but receive it with thanks. For we know that it is made acceptable by the word of God in prayer. Now he gets into the part that we want to focus on. If you explain these things to the brothers and sisters, Timothy, you will be a worthy servant of Jesus Christ, one who is nourished by the message of faith and the good teaching you follow. So he's saying, you need to teach everybody this. He said, Timothy, as a pastor, you need to implore your people to follow what I'm saying. Now, it's interesting because this is getting ready to get really good. The part that he is saying that what Timothy should do, that he should emphasize, that he should tell every church member, you need to do this. He said, um, don't waste time over arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Now, here's the kicker. Instead, train yourself to be godly. And that's what we're going to be doing over the next several weeks. We're going to talk about establishing spiritual habits, things that are going to help you. You're going to train yourself. I'll explain what that word means in just a minute. Uh, but he said, this is what you need to teach everybody in the church. Every Christian needs to learn this. He said, physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better. Promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. So he's saying, he's not saying don't exercise. He's not saying don't take care of your body. What he's saying is that spiritual discipline, spiritual training, this is the most important training you can do. It's exercise. It is working. And we believe in the grace of God. Now, God's grace is freely given. You cannot earn God's grace. You realize that, right? God's not going to love you anymore just because of, you know, all the good things you do. You can help all the little, lady, little old ladies across the street this week. You can give. You can be super nice you can not even curse anybody in traffic when you're driving into Atlanta. You can do all these good things. And guess what? God's not going to love you any more than he does right now. And because of grace, the flip side of that is true. You say, well, I didn't do too hot this week. Well, that's okay. God still loves you. His grace is freely given. But understand something about the grace of God. It is God working on our behalf. But that does not mean God's against you working. There is an idea among many pastors and church leaders in this culture that grace is so important, and it is. I think it's one of the most important things in the Christian life to be able to understand. But they act as if that just because everything is of God's grace, that you don't have to have discipline or you don't have to put in any effort. Grace is not against effort. It's against self-effort. Grace is not against trying. It's against you thinking that you are the key to the success rather than God. So God's not against you trying and being disciplined. In fact, we're going to see in a second that the opposite is true. He said this is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. This is why, and notice here what he said, we 
work hard. God is not against hard work. He wants you to depend on him. He wants you to realize he is the source. But he is not against you working hard. In fact, he says, Paul's writing this. He said, this is why I, we work hard, notice, and continue to struggle. You know what that tells me? If the apostle Paul struggled with spiritual habits, then you and I will too. In other words, we've got to make sure that we establish these habits. Because if the apostle Paul needed it, you and I especially are going to need it. He said, we'll continue to struggle for, once again, this is reminding of the grace of God. Our hope is in the living God, who is the savior of all people, and particularly of all believers. And then he emphasizes this again, that Timothy, the pastor, is to teach this to the church. He said, teach these things and insist that everyone learn them. Now, that's pretty strong wording, isn't it? Uh, Timothy, teach these things and insist that everyone learn them. And so we have it directly from God that we need to focus and work hard and work through the struggle and insist in our own lives that we develop the kind of habits that matter. Now today, by way of application, I'm gonna give you three questions. And I think this will help us learn how to establish the right kind of spiritual habits in our life. Here's the first question. Why should you develop spiritual habits? Well, other than the fact that the Bible says so, um, there are some reasons you should establish spiritual habits. Now, the word train means to exercise naked. I've told you this before. It means to exercise naked. Now, please understand what the Bible is saying here. Do not show up at your workout place and start stripping down and say, the pastor said I'm to exercise naked. No, nobody wants to see that, trust me, all right? I mean, there may be a few, but it's a very, very, very small minority that people might like to see. But just trust me, uh, for most of us in the room, you exercise naked, people are not going to go, ooh, they're going to go, ooh. So what does that mean to exercise naked? Well, it goes back to the games, the Olympic style games that they had in those days. The athletes actually competed completely naked. They thought that this was laying aside the things that would hinder them. And so the concept here is that you're to lay aside anything that hinders or restricts you. Now, maybe you're a runner, okay? And uh, you know that if you're going to run effectively, you gotta dress for it. Now, what if you showed up to a, a 5K You had worked out. You said, I'm going to be able to run this 3.1 miles. I've set this as a goal. I'm going to accomplish it. And on the day, you had trained, you had eaten right, you had worked hard. And on the day of the race, you showed up wearing fishing waders instead of running shoes. Now, here's the cool thing about fishing waders. They're great for what they're designed for. As As a young, as a kid, as a teenager, we used to go, Gigging. If you don't know what that is, you take this spear-like thing and you go and you, you, you stab fish. And uh, you would, we'd wade in the creeks and the rivers and we'd get frogs. If you don't like frog legs, you've never had really good meat, okay? So I like frog legs. I like fish. We used to go in the bay uh, down in Florida and we would go flounder gigging and we'd stab them and we'd be able to have this nice, delicious fish. So wearing waders to do that is awesome. But wearing waders to run a race is not awesome. You know why? Not that the waders are bad, but they are not designed to run in. And so what God is telling us is that when we learn to have spiritual discipline, 
we are exercising naked. We are laying aside the things that hinder us. So why should you even worry about developing spiritual habits? Well, first of all, I think it's because he promises here to give us discernment. He said there, talked about the true faith. You know, there are few people in this life that have real discernment, especially spiritually. You can be so deceived, so tricked. You can be completely in love with the Lord. You have the right heart, the right mindset, and yet you can be deceived. And why is that? It's because you have not developed spiritual discernment. And what God promises to do for us is when we develop these spiritual habits, he's going to give us discernment. Wouldn't discernment be a handy tool to have in so many areas of life? Of course it would. Hebrews 5.14, but solid food is for the mature, for those who have the powers of discernment trained. In other words, you can train this, you can get better at this by constant practice to discern good from evil. So what is he saying? By practicing, by having spiritual discipline, by uh, exercising spiritual habits, you're going to develop more discernment. Then you're going to have improvement. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. That's spiritual growth. That's spiritual maturity. Uh, To use a theological word, that's sanctification. You're becoming more like Jesus. You're becoming a better person. Another reason you should learn to practice spiritual habits is the blessings that it brings to you. Listen, I got three verses to read. Psalm 37, 9. For the wicked shall be destroyed, but those who trust in the Lord shall be given every blessing. I don't know about you, but I want to get in on that. Psalm 37, 11. But all those who humble themselves before the Lord, that is an act of spiritual discipline. They shall be given every blessing and shall have wonderful peace. So not just a blessing, but peace as well. Pretty good reason to develop a spiritual habit, isn't it? Then Proverbs nineteen twenty three: The fear of the Lord leads to life, bringing security and protection from harm. I don't know about you, but I'd love to have that security and that protection from harm. I do believe that God is in control. He's sovereign. Many of you know that uh, about a month ago or so, um, our property was hit by a tornado, did a lot of damage. I was sitting in our house and all the windows exploded in on me. I was completely covered with glass. There was glass in every room in our house. And there was a tree branch that came through our window and um, missed my head by about that much. Now, you can believe what you want. You can say, well, you were lucky. I don't really believe in luck. You can say, well, you were fortunate. And, yeah, okay, whatever, maybe. But you know what I believe in? I believe in the protection of God. I believe that with all my heart. I told someone the other day, when I get to heaven, my guardian angel is going to walk up to me and go, thank God I can finally get some rest now. (laughs) Now, my point is this. When you begin to develop spiritual habits, there is more spiritual protection in your life. There's more security in your life. And then another thing, is you become much more productive. You get productivity. He said, don't waste your time on silly things. Do you know how many people waste their time on silly things? And part of that is because they don't have the spiritual discipline to know the difference. Lots of people are sucked into social media arguments and silliness and stuff online. You know what they're doing? They're doing exactly what Paul said, don't do. Don't waste your time on silly things. Now, I'm not suggesting that you should never go on social media. Um, We use social media for good for our church, okay? 
But I am saying that if you try to send me a message on Facebook and I don't answer, there's a reason for that. It's not that I don't like you. It's because I don't ever go on there, all right? Now, God says you can become more productive. And then you get transformation. Romans 8, 29 Those who God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. God wants to transform your life. So why should you have spiritual habits? Why should you develop this? Well, there are several good reasons. Here's the second question. How do you develop spiritual habits? How's it done? A lot of people make a mistake when it comes time to develop a spiritual habit. Uh, A lot of people make a mistake when it comes time to develop a personal habit. Have you ever done this? It's the new year, you make a resolution, you're gonna lose weight, you're gonna join a gym, and uh, there are, I imagine, billions of dollars wasted every year in our country on people joining a gym in January, and then by February, they don't go the rest of the year. So, um, how do you establish the right kind of habit? Well, I think there's a couple things. You gotta remove bad habits by replacing them with good habits. You see, this is one of the mistakes people make, is they get, their eyes get real big. Oh, I'm gonna... I'm gonna lose 50 pounds in the next two months. And they starve themselves to death for two days and then they go on a binge because they're starving to death and then by the end of January, they've actually gained five pounds. So how do you establish spiritual habits? Well, it's the same way as in establishing personal habits. You gotta remove bad habits by replacing them with good habits. Let me give you an, ex- uh, an example. Uh, my father uh, used to smoke. Now, I grew up on a tobacco farm. Everybody in our family smoked or dipped or chewed. My dad actually did all three. And I have seen my father when he was in his 20s. I've actually seen him with a dip of snuff. And I'm not talking about Copenhagen. I'm talking about the old dry powdery stuff that your great grandma used to dip. And she'd say, come here, honey, give me some sugar. And you're like, no, thank you. (laughs) He had the dry snuff in his mouth. He had a chew of tobacco. And uh, it was uh, the, I think it was a beech nut. It was the old plug tobacco. You had to cut off a big piece. So he had had snuff in his lip. And he had chewing tobacco in his jaw. And he was smoking a cigarette at the same time. (laughs) Now, I don't know about you, but that is nicotine overload, all right? And he knew he needed to quit. He wanted to quit, and he knew it was affecting his health. And so what he did was, is he replaced a bad habit, or in that case, three bad habits, with a good habit. You know what he did? And and this was rather extreme. He decided he was going to start running, jogging, exercising. So he quit, he said, I'm gonna stop doing this, and he started working out every day. Now, when he first started out, he wanted to run a mile, and he had the old Converse all-star canvas tennis shoes. Remember those, those basketball shoes? And that's what he had to run in, which are terrible to run in, but he made it a mile, but he had literally to crawl into our yard on his hands and knees to make it. He was so out of shape. And uh, so winded from all the smoking and so forth. But he kept at it. And after a while, he began to be recognized in our neighborhood. This was hilarious. There would be people. This was back in like the late 60s, early 70s. Nobody really jogged back in those days. And so people would stop. And we lived out in the country. People would stop. And they'd see my dad and they'd go, what's wrong, Roger? What are you running from? And he'd be like, well, I'm not running from anything. I'm just exercising. And they're like, why? (laughs) And and he's like, well, I'm I'm trying to exercise, trying to get into shape. And they said, can we give you a ride home? He said, no, I'm actually trying to be disciplined in this. 
And so what he did was, is he replaced a bad habit with a good habit that, you know, that he eventually enjoyed doing. My dad, he told me, he figures that he has run around 40,000 miles in his lifetime. Now, you know what he did? He established a habit. And he did it by replacing a bad habit with a good habit. Now, he said, Paul wrote, he said, to train yourself for godliness. Lay aside the things that hinder you. And you gotta take up the things that help you. So if you're gonna establish a good habit, remove the bad, replace it with the good, and then number two, you gotta retrain your brain. You gotta change the way you think. Here's what we've learned. If you're going to be successful long-term at anything, you gotta change the way you think. Anybody that's gonna lose weight and live a healthy lifestyle, they don't do it by watching an infomercial and buying the latest gadget, the latest pills, or whatever. You know what they have to have? They have to have a change of thinking. Literally, they have to understand that if they don't do this, there are gonna be some bad consequences. And sometimes it takes people having a doctor tell them, if you don't change your habits, you're not gonna be here to see your daughter graduate from high school. And how a person can change and stay changed is they have to retrain their brain. Now, I want you to go back to what Paul wrote to Timothy. He said that he is one who is nourished by the message of faith. He's fed spiritually. Uh, To nourish means to nourish up and to nourish in. It means to educate or to form the mind. And so what Paul was telling Timothy was when you exercise for godliness, you develop these spiritual habits, what happens is it changes your mind. It changes the way you think. And then it nourishes you up and it nourishes you in. Sometimes we need nourishing up. I mean, when you're trying to stay in the game, when you're trying to stay at it, you got to get nourished up. Sometimes you got to encourage yourself. Sometimes you got to be reminded of why you're doing this. You get nourished up. It's like a runner that is going to run a marathon normally the night before or a couple nights before they do what is known as carbo loading. Um, They'll end up eating a lot of spaghetti or potatoes or all kinds of stuff that feeds their body. You know what they're doing? They're nourishing up. They're getting ready. But sometimes you gotta be nourished in. A marathon runner, you know what they have to do? Not only do they carbo load and nourish up, but during the race, they gotta nourish in the race. Uh, Anybody that runs a marathon knows this. They have to stop and drink water. They drink some kind of electrolytes that's gonna replace the electrolytes in their body, sometimes they'll eat orange wedges, sometimes they'll eat salted potatoes, sometimes they get these gel packs. You know what they're doing? They're nourishing in. And here's what God's telling us. When you do this, you form the mind and you establish a spiritual habit that is going to nourish you up to get you ready for it and to nourish you in to get you through it. Ephesians 4, 21 to 24 says, since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes and put on. The new nature created to be like God, truly righteous. Given us this metaphor, you put on that new nature like you would put on a coat. You know? So in other words, it may not come naturally to you, but you can put it on. And you can stay with it. You see, spiritual growth is God's work, but you do play a part in it. You're not 
just a passive recipient of spiritual growth. Yes, the Holy Spirit can help you grow. Yes, without the Holy Spirit, you will not grow. Yes, without the Word of God, uh, both reading it and hearing it taught, you won't grow. But you play a part. You've got a reason to do these things. That's what he's saying. So that brings us to our third and final question. Where do you start? Why do you do it? How do you build those habits? And where do you start? Well, over the next several weeks, we're going to talk to you about starting with small steps. One of the great mistakes that people can make is they get very enthusiastic about the change they want in their life. And even with spiritual disciplines, spiritual habits, and they take too big of a step. I've known people that are like, you know what, I'm going to read the Bible through every 30 days. They've never even gotten past the book of Genesis before in their life. But they think that if they can read 40 or 50 chapters a day, then that's what God would have them to do. And I do not disagree that reading 40 or 50 chapters a day would be a good thing. But you probably don't have that much time and you probably don't have that much attention span. But what you can do is you can start small. You can start by getting, and we're gonna talk about this the next week or so. Um, You can start, and I'm gonna tell you ways to do this, but start small. If you have not identified prayer in your life, don't set a goal to pray two hours a day. You're probably not gonna do that. You say, well, I'm gonna get up at four o'clock every morning and start my day with prayer. That would be awesome if you would actually do it, okay? But what would be better than starting and praying for two days and then forgetting about it the rest of the year would be to start small, to take a small step. Remember, we say this a lot, your next step is your most important step. Make those decisions consistently and well. So I'm gonna give you a place to start this week. Okay, this is the practical aspect of this message. Start with worship. I'll tell you this, the more you fall in love with Jesus, the more you think about him, the easier it's going to be for you to develop spiritual habits. And so here's where I want you to start. Start with worship. Now what is worship? It is focusing your attention and your affection on God. Now there are two ways that I want you to worship those of you online and in the room. You worship by attending church on Sunday. That's very, very important. But you also can worship daily. And here's what I want you to do. It'll be on the screen. You start your day this way. God, I love you. I give my day to you. Let me live for your purpose today. And I thank you for, and you start your day by thanking God for something. In Jesus' name, amen. Now look, I hope you'll take a picture of that. I hope you'll remember that. Because if you will start your day simply by worshiping God. Remember, worship, you don't have to be in a swoon. You don't have to have goosebumps. You don't even have to have uh, heavenly sounding music playing. You know what you can do? You can start your day by focusing your attention on God. And when we pray to him... God, I love you. I give my day to you. Let me live for your purpose today. And I thank you for my family, for Jesus, for forgiveness. It's easy to come up with a lot of things to be thankful for. But if you'll intentionally do it, I really do believe by taking this small step, you're going to begin to establish spiritual habits. Now, maybe you're already there. Maybe you already read the Bible and pray and you have all these spiritual disciplines and that's great. But no matter where you are on this spectrum, I know this. Starting your day this way is always better. And so I wanna challenge you. Start your day. I'm gonna read it for the third time. God, I love you. I give my day to you. Let me live for your purpose today. And I thank you for it. Fill in the blank. And I believe by doing this, You're going to grow, you'll become more thankful, you'll have a better attitude, and you're going to begin to become more like Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. 
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for every person listening to this message. God, I pray that you just speak to all of us. Help all of us to begin to develop these spiritual habits that you want for our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Before we finish today, I wonder, do you need, first of all, to pray a prayer that God always answers? If you've not been saved, if you've not received Christ, if you've not begun that relationship with God, you can say something like this to the Lord. Dear God, I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I ask you to come into my life and save me today. I believe Jesus rose from the grave and I'm asking you to be my savior. If you'll say something like that, God promises that he will answer that prayer. And so if you want to pray that prayer today in the room, take your next step card, put your name on it, check that you prayed to receive Christ today, and then drop it at uh, Next Step Central here uh, to my right, your left, at the back of the room. Online, make sure you click at the bottom and let us know. Maybe there's somebody that would say, you know what? While you were speaking, the Holy Spirit spoke to me about... Maybe it's a habit that you need to quit. Or maybe it's a habit you need to start. And so whatever that is, I hope you'll commit that to the Lord. Give it fully to him. I'm going to pray a second time to end the message. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for all of these things that we can do to become better. I pray that you'd help our church, Lord, to insist on these spiritual habits, to begin to develop them, to grow stronger and so they can please you with their life. And Lord, we love you today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.